Hey everybody, I am Tin Tim, that's T-I-N as in, no she didn't, T-I-M as in, move out the way! For those of you just meeting me, I am America's first drag queen public intellectual, aka the Cornell motherfucking West of drag. I am thrilled to finally be here talking to you about episode two of season five. This week, the queens were given a performance challenge where they had to become queens from previous seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race in sort of famous dramatic scenes from episodes of Untucked. This was the kind of challenge that I'm guessing was probably really polarizing, like people either loved it or despised it. The level of kind of, you know, self-importance to build an entire challenge around their own history. I thought that it was brilliant, kind of meta level of the show, commenting on the show, self-mythologizing, right, like creating their own history, and rather to, than making it an acting challenge, to have the queens lip sync to the spoken words of the actual queen, you know, I thought was brilliant. It's not anything we've ever seen on the show before, and it's something that there's like a history and precedent for in the world of drag, and it is also a very drag-specific skill that is incredibly difficult to master, you know, even for some really experienced queens. So I thought that was very cool. And what made it even better then to have Rue call upon Lip Sinka and kind of teach the children, you know, Lip Sinka is a legendary figure in drag history. And what's really cool about her is that she kind of brings together a lot of these different elements within drag and drag history. So there's kind of this camp element as far as like, you know, lip syncing to the grand dramatic old actresses. Then there's also this glamorous, pretty element. She's very polished and composed in her appearance. But then she was also part of, you know, the kind of downtown Manhattan performance scene of the 1980s. You know, this kind of underground freak drag scene. Places like Pyramid Club, where RuPaul and Lady Bunny also performed, calls upon that history and places the show in the context of that history in like a really cool way. Moving on to Monica Beverly Hills, the first thing that I want to say about this is just that Chicago could not be prouder of Monica and happier for her. I think what she did showed great courage. That said, I don't believe that people should have to show great courage just to be who they are and to share who they are in the most basic of ways. There is a very long and a very rich history in drag communities of transgender performers. Because I think while well, on the one hand they're kind of always there and always a part of the community, there is also this way that the whole kind of assumption that, you know, the norm of drag is gay men dressing up as women, I think kind of makes them invisible. That has definitely been true on the show. I've seen conflicting reports on what the show's actual policy on trans contestants is or has been. What I will say is that regardless of what the policy on inclusion is or isn't, if it was truly a trans-inclusive space, meaning trans was seen as a, as a component of the broader image or definition of what drag is, then people would not have to come out tearfully on the runway and then have that kind of exploited for the dramatic effect of it. And again, like whether the show allows trans people or doesn't officially in their policy, Monica, for whatever reason, felt like that was something she needed to hide to be accepted to be a competitor. And that I think does real kind of psychological, psychic damage. There's a really great piece by a trans performer as well as activist nonprofit worker here in Chicago named Precious Jewel that I will link down below where she talks about being approached by producers of the show actually to send an audition video and then having to pretend to be male identified again for the sake of the video. You know, the decision she went through about whether or not to do that, what did that mean for her and her identity and her activism, and you know, how she uses the video now as a teaching tool with young people. It's a really great, really powerful piece. So while I am happy that the show has made space for Monica and made, made the space safe for her, I do still think that there's this way that it has constructed the norm of drag as gay men in a way that I th think has the potential to or has pushed trans performers to the margins 
And, you know, I think that's a problem on the show and in the broader drag community, either explicit or more unconscious, internalized kind of transphobia, this desire to distance what we do as artists from being trans to not be associated with transness. Overemphasize that to the point that I think it stigmatizes. People act like identifying as women somehow gives trans folks an unfair advantage as performers, but I think that it takes just as much work to prepare and to perform. The notion that if there are trans folks that have made decisions to pursue biological interventions of one kind or another, whether that's hormones or surgeries, that that somehow means there's less to have to transform, so like it's less work or something. First of all, my general experience of trans etiquette and, you know, how to be a good ally to trans communities, you honor whatever people's self-identification is, you use their preferred pronouns, but to ask them about their, their choices about things like hormones or surgeries is, you know, not considered, is considered invasive and, you know, not really good etiquette. Second of all, I don't think that hormones or, or surgeries or whatever are any more of like an unfair advantage or whatever than any of the the other things that male identified drag queens do like you know plastic surgeries etc i think there's this desire to kind of like start from some even place that doesn't really exist no matter how you identify if you identify as a man if you identify as a woman when you're not on stage you still have to bring your a game and i think that's just as challenging regardless i hope that we can see both the show and the broader drag world, as well as the community of fans, become more of a trans-supportive, trans-inclusive space. That is all for this week. Thanks for joining me, and I look forward to chatting with you all again for episode three. Mwah!